Hello, everyone. My name is Chrissy Castle, and I'm honored to be your Dallas Bar Association president. I'm a plaintiff's personal injury trial lawyer, and I founded Castle Law PC in 2006, a plaintiff's personal injury firm right here in Dallas, Texas. I'm so excited to be here for the Living Legends series, and I'm so thankful to our past president, Aaron Tobin, for his vision for such a program. The Dallas Bar's mission is to promote good relations among judges, lawyers, and our community. And this program does just that. Castle Law PC is a very proud sponsor of today's Living Legend interview with entrepreneur and trial lawyer, Donald E. Godwin, our first male living legend. Welcome, Don. Thank you, Chrissy. I appreciate uh, you and the Dallas Bar asking me to participate in this uh, uh, series of, of, of interviews, if you will. I would say to you that as before we start, I was a little uncomfortable when asked to be a, uh, a living legend and that I don't think of myself that way. And, uh, but I do appreciate the honor that has uh, been, been given by asking me to participate and, uh, and it means a lot to me, although I don't quite understand why I was chosen, frankly. Well, it's an honor well earned, Thon. You really have done quite a bit in the community. You are an exceptional living legend, and I'm gonna take a minute to talk a little bit about all that you've done. Thank you. I first learned of you uh, my first year in law school about your many successes and uh, the stalwart that you are here in the Dallas community. Uh, Donald Godwin received a bachelor's degree in science from the University of North Carolina at Wilmington and an MS in accounting from the University of Memphis where he became a certified CPA. Don thought he might become a CPA, but SMU had other plans. Don ended up in Dallas. We'll let him tell you a little bit more about that and graduated from SMU School of Law. Don became board certified by the Texas Board of Legal Specialization. Don is the chairman and CEO of Texas-based Godwin Bowman PC and is one of the most respected trial lawyers in the nation. He started his own firm and the firm Godwin Bowman uh, follows in his success and reputation. He was the lead trial counsel for Halliburton and its successful defense regarding the civil litigation and investigations concerning the 80 billion well blowout in the Gulf of Mexico. Besides his status as a leading trial lawyer, Don has always earned the reputation as a master negotiator. He fights for his clients and negotiates the best deal possible. He's a member of ABOTA, the American Board of Trial Advocates, Don has regularly enjoyed a highly decorated career. He has been recognized multiple times by the Chamber USA in the area of general commercial litigation, has been chosen to the list of best lawyers in America since 2012 in the field of commercial litigation, and has been honored with four times section to the Law Dragon 500 leading lawyers in America. He has been named one of the 50 Lions of the Texas Bar by Texas Law Book has been selected 10 times to Thomson Reuters list of top 100 lawyers in Texas, 14 times to that organization's list of best lawyers in Dallas, and 16 times to their list of Texas super lawyers, recognizing the top 5% of attorneys in the state. His AV rated, his AV rated preeminent by Martindale Hubble, their highest rating for legal ability and ethics and has been selected 11 times by D Magazine, among the best lawyers in Dallas. Don, you've had quite a successful career, and many may not know where you grew up. Can you tell us a little bit about where you grew up and how it is you became a lawyer? Well, I uh, grew up in North Carolina. I was born into a farming family in the middle part of the state in Dunn, North Carolina. Um, and, and after a couple of years, we moved down to Jacksonville, North Carolina, uh, and from there ended up in Wilmington, uh, and where I really grew up and, um, and before I went off to college. And um, of course, I, you know, I was there for 
all of my childhood years and and whatever and high, you know, junior high and high school years and and then of course went to college and then from college in North Carolina to graduate school in Tennessee uh, to law school at SMU. When I left North Carolina to go to Tennessee, I had only been to two states uh, in my lifetime. I'd been to, well, Virginia, D Washington, D.C. Uh, on a school tour when I was in the fifth grade. I know it sounds funny, but that was it. And then, uh, and then down to South Carolina, so whenever I went out to Tennessee to go to school, it was the third state I'd been to, if you will. And, um, and of course, to come over to Texas, I'd never been as far west as Texas. That was when I came out here to interview for a scholarship and, uh, and then later come to law school out here. But after I got here to Texas, I fell in love with it and I never went back home again. Tell us a little bit about your family growing up. You have your mother, your father, any siblings? Uh, my family and growing up, uh, my dad was a farmer. Uh, uh, my mother was a housekeeper for a number of families there in town. And I um, had a sister and a brother. Um, and, and we, of course, grew up not knowing that we weren't all that privileged, if you will. Uh, but frankly, looking back on it, we weren't. Probably knew it then as well. Uh, at 11 years old, I, I went out and bought me a, a used bicycle and uh, that I was going to use to run a newspaper route every day and a used lawnmower that I could mow lawns in North Carolina on the coast. You could mow lawns for eight, nine months a year. And uh, I started working and that enabled me to be able to provide money and set money aside to give it to my mother. When I turned 11, my dream was my mother not have to be a, a housekeeper or maid for anybody else again. And after that, she never did. Well, that's really nice. Well, it's just what you do when you have to do it. And you just, you do what needs to be done for the best interest of your family. And that's what I did. And were you the oldest, youngest, middle child? I was the oldest of three. The oldest of three. Oldest of three. Brothers, sisters? I got a, a sister when you're younger. And then I got a brother. He's now passed away. Sorry. Uh, he died in 2005 in a boating accident in North Carolina. Uh, but anyway, so me and my sister are alive. My mother and dad, of course, have gone and uh, what have you. But um, it's, a, it's a close family. We All, all of us worked hard um, to get where we are. And you started working at 11. Started working at 11. And then, and then uh, one of my proudest days was honestly uh, when I turned 16 in North Carolina, you could get a Social Security card. And that allowed, enabled me to go to work for companies there. And I, I got my social security card and first place I stopped was at Winn-Dixie. I knew some guys that worked over there a little bit older than me. And I went over and I got a job sacking groceries and working in the meat department and produce and whatever. And one thing or another, just doing what needed to be done. And then from there, the rest is history. And so what is that history? Cause we're not, familiar with it. Tell us a little bit about um, your manager and what he may have seen yeah. in you. Well, I um, I was over there working at Winn-Dixie and I was doing quite well um, and worked hard. And, um, uh, you know, to be quite candid with you, um, my goal the whole time I was in high school was to one day be a manager of a Winn-Dixie food store. I never dreamed of having a college degree, certainly never dreamed of being a lawyer. Uh, the church I went to in North Carolina, we kind of sat on the back road toward the back of the church and the lawyers and doctors and other people sat pretty much near the front. I say that in a, to be facetious, but it wasn't that far from the truth. But anyway, um, after I started to win Dixie, I worked really hard to try to impress them as to what I could do in hopes that after I got out of high school, I could work my way on up. And, uh, and as I got out of high school, I didn't go to college right away. I had no really intention to go. Nobody in my family had ever been. My dad got to the 10th grade in school. My mother, she graduated high school, but soon started working as she was doing for families to help them. And um, so I went to work for Winn-Dixie. And, and for about a year before I ever started school, I was between high school and college. and. And one afternoon, the gentleman who was in charge of 
the, that division of North Carolina and South Carolina, Virginia, a gentleman named Robert Little, he called me to the front desk on the microphone, Don Godwin, come to the front office. Of course, I didn't like the sound of that coming to the front office. I thought, sure enough, <laughs> this is going to be the end of it. And I don't know what I would do. I went to the front office and started, Mr. Little, what are you, what's going on? Uh, I've been really working hard. He said, Don, I know that. I know that. And he said, uh, Don, I've liked you and I've watched you and you've worked really hard the last few years. And I want to say if there's some way I can help you. I said, well, I pr certainly appreciate it. I mean, you're already helping me. I've got a good job. And he said, well, when dixie gives out, there's a large grocery chain based in Jacksonville, Florida. And they give out 13 scholarships a year, one for each state. And, uh, and I've got a couple of them this year I'm going to be able to recommend students uh, because I've got two states and uh, completely two states and part of Virginia. And I want to recommend you for one of those two positions. And I said, well, I don't know what I'm supposed to do. And he said, well... First thing I do is take a test that Win Dixie will administer, see if they think you can make it to get into college and go from there. And I said, okay. So I took the test and he reported back to me that I did well on it. And that was some weeks later. And he said, Don, you did really well. And he said, so I'm going to recommend you. So he recommended me for a scholarship to go to college and they would pay my, uh, in North Carolina, they paid my room and board and tuition and, um, and uh, required that I work so many hours a week still at the store, kind of like on the weekend and on Friday, but I did some during the week. And I, um, I, I you know, started school and in three years I graduated with a four-year degree in accounting. And What were you gonna do with that accounting degree? Well, what was I your wanted, plan? Uh, my goal was, was to, you know, after I decided I could go on beyond being a store manager, I wanted to then maybe you know, work in the in the finance department or accounting department with Win Dixie, and uh, that was what my goal was, and work my way up from there, because I was always setting goals higher for me than I, myself than I had before, and I did in the final year of, of undergraduate school, I did pass the CPA exam, but to correct you, I never actually was licensed because I never worked in an accounting firm, but I, you had to have so much experience. And uh, unlike in the legal profession where you can get a law license by passing examination as a CPA back in those years, you had to take the exam. There were four parts to it. And I passed them. And then you had to work for a couple of years in the firm. I never did that because I went straight on off to graduate school and then later law school. How does it that you ended up at graduate school? Well, I was uh, at, there at the University of North Carolina at Wilmington. And, and the gentleman who was in charge of the, of the accounting department, if you will, he, um, he approached me toward the end of the senior year in undergraduate school and said, Don, what are you, you going to do now? You've done really well in school, and I, I'd had excellent grades and whatever. And I said, well, I'm going to get out, and I'm going to go to Winn-Dixie in Raleigh, North Carolina, their uh, headquarters there, uh, regional headquarters, and I'm going to get a good job in the accounting department. And he said, well, why don't you try graduate school? You seem to really like tax, <clears throat> and you're really good with the Internal Revenue Code, and I, which I did like it, and I enjoyed it. Uh, and he said, why don't you give out a try? So I said, well, I never thought about going to graduate school, but likewise, I never thought about going to college, and here I'm getting ready to get out with a degree. And so he said, well, you're going to need to take the GRE. I think it's graduate records examination. I remember that years ago. You got to pass that and make a certain score for me to be able to recommend you and get you a scholarship, University of Memphis. I said, really? So I took the exam and got the score back, and it was a good score. And um, I don't know how I did it, but I did. And uh, I told him, and he said, that's excellent. And he saw the paper that came with it. And uh, he said, Donnie said, you know, I, um, I went to University of Memphis and got my master's degree. And then I went over to University of Georgia and got my Ph.D. in accounting. And I don't think you want to go on and get a Ph.D. because you don't seem like the teacher type. But he says, uh, you ought to go get that graduate degree and see where it leads you. So I applied and I got in and I got a full scholarship to a, it was about a two year program. I finished a year and a half and early, and I was taking more hours each semester than needed, 
and, and went to school all summer. Went out to Memphis where I was in school and um, got ready to get out of, uh, out of graduate school and that's when the law school opportunity came about. And so how is it that the law school opportunity came about? Well, I had become, I was a graduate assistant while in graduate school and in doing that, you you put the exams, teach it to, to test together for the students. And t I was teaching actually the uh, first year uh, graduate uh, first year students in undergraduate school, and uh, I'd become good friends with Dr. Spicelin, and he was the head of the accounting department. And then there was a Dr. James Thompson's head of the business school at large. And one day they both called me into. Dr. Thompson's office as I was about close to a semester from getting out of graduate school. And they said, Don said, um, you know, you're about to graduate real high in your class and you've done really well. And you've of course been a great graduate assistant. I said, I've loved every minute of it. I never thought I'd like school this much, you know? And they said, I, as a graduate assistant, I was also able to get paid some money and that helped me with spending money and things. Always nice. It was, yeah, it was helpful. And so um, anyway, they both said, what are you going to do now that you got your bachelor's degree and your master's degree? You going to get, start working and then earn your CPA certificate? And I said, well, that's what my goal, my goal is. Go down to Jasper, Florida and work in uh, Winn-Dixie in their uh, national headquarters. And they said, really? And they said, um, and what are you going to do there? I said, well, I don't know yet, but I've been in touch with them and they say through Mr. Little, and I could come down there and they put me in that headquarters and I'm gonna just try to work myself right as high up in the company as I can go. I don't know where to land. And they said, well, that sounds great, but Don, we'd like you to try something different. And I said, well, what would you like for me to do different? I mean, um, I'm liking what I'm doing. They said, well, you seem to really like taxes. And I did, as they told me in undergraduate school, and you seem to, you're a good student, uh, and you know, and you, you enjoy being around people, meeting people, and whatever. You ought to think about being a lawyer, and, and maybe perhaps a tax lawyer. Well, I said, you know, by then I was educated enough to understand what these positions were, and I said, well, you know, I, that's admirable, but I don't have any uh, wherewithal to go to law school, and when Dixie's not in need of any lawyers inside. <laughs> and, uh, and so I don't know what I would do. And they said, well, we think that if you could do well on your LSAT examination, with your grades in undergraduate school and graduate school, we think that you could perhaps get a scholarship to SMU. And I said, really? And because I never looked into it, never thought anything about it. And I know by then my mother and dad were wondering when you're going to get out of school, you know, you've been <laughs> going now for two degrees. And uh, they were supportive, those always. And um, so I said, well, okay, what do I do? And, they, and that's when Dr. Thompson says, I know a gentleman here in Memphis named John Kimbrough. And he's uh, from a very prominent family in town. He's a prominent, prominent tax lawyer. I'd like for you to meet him. I'd like for you to see what he's about, go down to his office and see what he thinks about maybe helping you with a school in Texas. And I said, well, I've never been to Texas. And they said, well, you've never been to Tennessee either, but you've done well out here. And I said, well, okay. So he arranged for me to go see Mr. Kimbrough. So I drove down to see him one afternoon and went in and of course a beautiful office is off the elevator. I'd never seen anything like it. And dark wood with oriental rugs like we have here at the Dallas Bar, and beautiful. And it was so impressive. And a lady came out and took me back, and we sat for a while and talked. And he said, Don, I like you. He said, uh, I've done a lot of checking on your undergraduate studies and, and your graduate studies and talked to Dr. Thompson. And he says they've done some checking on you in North Carolina and whatever, and you're somebody that's worked hard and might deserve a break. And I said, well, I already feel like I've had more breaks than I deserve, you know, by going to college and undergraduate school, graduate school, I mean, people have been helping my life I never dreamed possible, which I really didn't. And he said, well, he said, uh, I want to see what I can do to help you. Why don't you take the LSAT 
while I was still in that last semester of school. So it so happens the LSAT was in about three or four weeks. And I said, well, I'll take it. And so it was on a Saturday, as I recall. I took the LSAT and I did well on it. And much better than I thought I was going to do. I did real well on it. Did you and get a scholarship to SMU School So well? Yeah, I did. And so I told him what the score was. Back then we didn't have email and all that. And I told him what the score was. And he was really pleased with it. And, and uh, anyway, he learned that as well and uh, from that organization and they did the testing. And so he recommended me to SMU. And I came down to SMU and interviewed for the uh, scholarship to go to law school. And I was given a scholarship to go to SMU for three years. And I lived there in Lawyer's Inn for two of those three years. And, uh, right. you know, had that provided and the books and what have you. And the rest, uh, I was able to work in the summers. And then after the first year, I started working during the year, some, you know, in the afternoons. Mm -hmm. But uh, just a matter of people along the way helping me give me opportunities I never dreamed possible. And when you had those opportunities, you took them. I made the best of them I could. The first thing you've got to do is be able to see an opportunity, and then you do with it what you can. And when those people were good enough to, to trust me and place their faith in me, I was not going to let them down, nor my mother or dad, who you know, always wanted the best for me, although they didn't have an education. And uh, so I took those opportunities and did the most with them I possibly could. And I continue doing that to this day. And so you graduated from law school and you went to work where? Well, I got out of law school in 1973. The first firm I went to work for was a firm called Line, L-Y-N-E, Line Klein, French and Womble. That was a very prominent then trial and labor firm. They represented the Hager Clothing Company that I might add that later on after I Many years after I left Lion Con, French and Womble, the Hager family invited me to be a member of the board of directors where I was for 12 years while it, when it was a public company. But I went to work for Lion Klein, French and Womble where I started out for about nine months as a tax lawyer. That's what I'd studied for, planned for. I'd never taken one day of trial practice or trial mock, nothing involving trial work had I ever done while I was in law school at SMU. I'd planned on being a tax lawyer. Well, after about nine months, one of the senior partners in the firm I was with, he, Mr. Dawson French, he asked me, said, Don, I need to have some help done. I've got a large case coming up where I'm representing a group of doctors in a hospital against the Department of Justice over some taxes they say are owed. I need some research done, and I'd like to have you involved help me. I'll be happy to help you, which I did. And... Gave him a lot of, because he was not a tax lawyer, but he was a heck of a good trial lawyer. Mm -hmm. And I gave him the law and the research and did all that. And I'd go with him to court every day. We were over there for about three weeks in that trial. And uh, uh, Robert Hill was the federal judge who I met for the first time, first day, when when we went over. And he swore me in in federal court, and uh, which was really neat. And I was over there, and we got through, and there was a couple of other defendants in addition, our law firm, who were represented by the lawyers, and, and our client won, another party won, and one party got stuck. And so, anyway, we went back to the office, and Mr. French went in to see uh, Fritz Lyon, who was the managing partner of the firm, and said, Fritz said, uh, you know, we got Don doing tax work. Said, you know, I've watched him, and he's helped me a lot, and I've talked to him a lot, and we ought to give him some of these smaller cases to handle and let him see what he can do with trial work, I think you'd be surprised what you'd find. And so did you get opportunities to try those smaller cases? Starting the next morning, Mr. Lyon told some of the other lawyers to give, load me up with a lot of small cases and collection cases for, you know, a lot of companies they represented. And I started those cases, and some of them could afford a deposition, some couldn't. Some of them you just go down and try the case, you know, with your file. Others, you do a deposition or whatever, but they weren't complicated like we are now. But I started taking those cases and settling them and trying them and trying a lot of them. And, um, and did you like it? And I loved it. And after a few months, three or four months, Mr. Lyon called me and he said, Don, he said, I keep getting good reports from the judges at the courthouse. And the judges back then would call the senior lawyers, as they may do now from time to time, you know, and and they keep saying you're doing a good job down there because I'd ask them about you. 
and the people around here saying you're doing a good job. He said, why don't you just continue doing trial work for a while? If you decide you want to do tax work again, we can put you back over there. I said, I'm kind of liking this trial work. <laughs> and after that, I never went back to doing tax again. No looking back. Well, I still can spot the issues and I can meet with people much smarter than I, and I can identify things that need to be done, but I don't look back on it and I never wanted to do uh, tax work again. And, you know, for 40 plus years now, I've been doing trial work uh, in Texas and a number of states around the country. Well, that's awesome. So tell us a little bit about your firm and, and all the, the different names over the years. Right. Well, one of the blessings that I've had from when we started our law firm, there were three of us on March 1, 1980, 42 years ago. Um, three of us, two of us are still together. The other one retired in 1992. We'd been very successful in the 80s and he took his money and moved to Oregon and retired. And the other one, George Carlton and I, we stayed behind and spent what money we had from what we'd made on some big cases and, and looked back wondering why did we stop too, but we kept going. <laughs> And well, who are the original three? There were three of us. It was Jim Maxwell, mm -hmm. George Carlton, and me, and very, very good guys and, and prominent lawyers. And then we started, and we started growing. Well, within a year, we were 12 lawyers and because we had a lot of business, and we were trying cases and a lot of people hiring us and whatever. And I'm talking about significant companies. Um, and we just continued to grow, and all during the 80s, uh, I was fortunate enough to represent Clayton Williams, who was a big old man out of Midland, Odessa area, and gave a lot of money to Texas A&M for the student union. Mm -hmm. Ran unsuccessfully to be governor of Texas, if you'll remember, against Ann Richards. Uh, but I worked for him for many years there, doing trial work for him in North Dakota, South Dakota, Wyoming, uh, Colorado, Texas, New Mexico, trying cases in these places where he had a lot of production and people were suing him, you know, over things related to wells. And I rep represent him. And then in the mid eighties, I started representing Tennessee, Ten Tennessee Gas Pipeline Company based in Houston, which at that time was the largest gas pipeline company in the United States. I got that work from, a, from the guy that was a general counsel of the pipeline, and I've done a lot of work for him successfully. That gentleman moved from Midland down to Houston. He called me when he got down there and he said, Don, he said, I've got some serious issues with some gas pipeline cases against the likes of John O'Quinn and Ernie Cannon and some really, really big name, big time tough lawyers. And I need to have you step in here to help me out. And I went down, met with him and some other lawyers and started doing in the mid 80s, uh, 86, I think it was, started doing uh, take or pay litigation for them and mm -hmm. cases all over South Texas, Wharton, down in Corpus Christi, a lot of different places and being very successful. And so all during the 80s, we were adding a lot of lawyers to help me with the Clayton Williams work, the Tennessee gas pipeline work, as well as the host of other clients as well. I was representing probably a dozen new car dealers in Dallas County then and doing their work and passing that work down. And Jim and George were representing INA and a number of other insurance companies. And we were doing quite well. We were doing very well. And we came up with an idea where we were doing alternative billing in the late, late in the eighties. And that was, we would take a, a reduced hourly rate and a, a bonus based upon the outcome of the case or uh, you know, a fixed fee on the case. And then after that, then we'd get a percentage of whatever we might recover if we were plaintiff or if we were defendant, some reverse contingency. And we did quite well at that. And we added a lot of lawyers and a lot of lawyers and a lot of success and uh, you know, just a great time. We went from three lawyers in 1980, to close out on this, we went from three lawyers in 1980 in 1991, we were 151 lawyers. Wow. We were a big law firm. By 1991, so in, what is that, 11 years? 1991, in 11 years, we've 1991, we were 150, 151 lawyers. I mean, we were not the largest firm in Dallas by any means. It was what was in Hewitt Johnson, Swanson and Barbie, and 
Mark Pennell, Born Laney, Neely. There was Rain Hurum, a young adult, did a lot of great firms, but we were a big law firm. And what and we thought we were gonna continue to grow. Well, we didn't have the infrastructure and didn't really have the wherewithal to understand what we were doing, trying to br branch over into transactional work. We we done really well and and have become quite successful doing trial work and and uh, board certified at Right out of law school in 73 and 79. So George what was the Carlton. actual name of your first law firm? First law firm was Maxwell Godwin and Carlton. And then that stayed together until Jim stayed like that. And when Jim, he took his money because we'd done really well on a big contingent fee case. And he bought him a ranch up in, in Oregon. And, uh, and uh, I believe it was Oregon. Sure it was, yeah, Oregon. And I never was up there, but he bought a big ranch up there I'm thinking a few thousand acres. And um, he had cattle up there and trees and whatever, and he really got into that. Well, he wanted to work more up there and come work still in Dallas some, which was okay, but I told him, I said, Jim, we're still, you know, we 11 year law firm, 91, we need to be working. We're growing, adding people. He said, well, Don, I don't like all this growing. I don't like all this transactional stuff we're doing. And well, we weren't doing real well with it but we were with our trial work. And so he said, you know, I think I'm just going to retire. By then, we'd started downsizing the transactional. And so did the firm name change? The firm name changed. It came Godwin Carlton, who was one of the other one of the three, right. Godwin Carlton. And How long were you Godwin Carlton? Godwin Carlton remained in place until like 19, from 91 until like 97. And it was Godwin White. Godwin Carlton and White, and David White, who was with us at that point, representing the FDIC and RTC, which was big, as you'll recall, back in the 90s. We were doing a lot of that work. And David White was a name partner as well. And that continued until 1999, when Mike Gruber and a group merged in with us, and it became Godwin Gruber. And it stayed with that way for a good long while until Mike left in 19. To, in 2005. So Godwin Gruber uh, handled still litigation and uh, well, transactional we, we got out of the transactional work in the early 90s, realizing that we just didn't know enough about it to really want to staff it up and spend the kind of money it needed. And the people we had had some business, but not the, not the volume of business that we needed to support that many attorneys and staff. And I had a lot of business. And uh, Jim did, and others did. We didn't have enough transactional work for it, and I had a ton of litigation work. By then, we were doing asbestos as well, so we got out of the transactional, and we just focused on all of our litigation. And Mike Gruber, who's a good friend, continues to be, and a great lawyer, uh, one of the finest I know. He and his team joined us in '99. It became Godwin Gruber, and um, we had we had some hellaciously successful years there, very successful. So that's what, when did you handle the Halliburton case? Well, I got hired on Hallib I got hired on that case on May the 1st of 2010. Mike had left me in two December of 2005. And, um, and uh, we continued thereafter doing well, uh, but he went and formed his own firm and it lasted for a number of years with Michael Hurst and some other good friends of mine. It, had been with me, and uh, and so it was in May the 1st of 2010, I got a call when I was at the Kentucky Derby. The only time I'd ever been to the Kentucky Derby. My wife and I went up there, and, and while I was there, the head of litigation called me and said that they needed to talk to me about a blowout in the Gulf of Mexico, because I'd handled a number of blowout cases for Halliburton and Dresser already. Dresser was a company that merged in with Halliburton in two, 1998, I was doing all their asbestos work. My firm and I were all over Texas, and I'd become national counsel for Halliburton in the early 2000s for all their asbestos all over the United States and probably 30, 35 states. Well, in 2010, this lawyer called me and said, Don, we need you to come down and see us. When are you going to be back in town? I said, well, just here for the weekend. I'll be back Sunday. I'll be there Monday morning. And she said, okay. 
So I went down to see her Sunday, Monday morning, and they said, we got a little well blow out down in the Gulf of Mexico, and you've handled a number of these successfully on shore. Need you to handle this one also. And I said, okay, I'll look into it. So they got me hired, and I went over to Metairie, Louisiana, with three or four lawyers with me, and we went over to take a look at it and see what was going to happen. And they were getting ready to start Coast Guard hearings involving the, potential, the liability for the, you know, as they could, although they really shouldn't have been doing that, but they were trying to decide the liability. Later ended up in federal court in New Orleans. We went over and we were in those uh, Coast Guard hearings for about three months. And I thought it was going to be a three-month stay and be done completely. How long was it? Almost five years. <laughs> and so we got over there in Louisiana and... Um, and when we did, uh, it was like unbelievable, the number of lawyers that BP had there, Halliburton, we had me and my team, and then there were lawyers there from, a few, Transocean was another defendant, and uh, and we had hearings there with a former federal judge out of Chicago, was a gentleman who was a head of the panel, a chair, if you will, that was trying this, uh, they were really searching for facts to see where the liability should be laid. And how did that, uh, how did how did the oil spill turn out for you and, and your clients? Well, I won the case. Uh, my client did. Halliburton did. Mm -hmm. uh, BP wasn't quite so successful, and ended up with the liability. And uh, my client settled a very small part of the cases along the way, but it was a very small part. But as far as the liability, that all that fell over on the BP. Uh, my client and Transocean got found liable for ordinary negligence, simple negligence, but we had full indemnity from BP. And so we, BP got it all put on them and they got found not liable for gross negligence. And so it became their problem. But we were over there, uh, Chrissy, I went over May the 1st, I got hired. And by the end of the year, there were hundreds of thousands of people that were filing lawsuits through plaintiff's lawyers, some of the best in the country, all down on the Gulf Coast and from Corpus Christi all the way to Miami Beach, Florida. Well, they were all being brought down there and there was a move to put them in multi-district litigation, which was successful. We ended up before Judge Carl Barbier, federal judge there in New Orleans and uh, in, the, in federal court with all the cases and that ultimately is where the liability was tried. Halliburton, Halliburton did well, uh, Transocean did well, and BP got stuck and with the liability. It was actually tried to yeah, a jury tried, in federal court? Not jury. In, federal, in maritime cases, you don't have a jury. Okay. You, you do a non-jury to a federal judge. That's maritime law. And so we went down there, and we prepared. We took probably, I bet we took from beginning to end before we went to trial, probably 450 depositions. Wow. Everybody in the world was being deposed, you know, with BP and Halliburton and Transocean and some other suppliers. And how long were you involved in that litigation? And the litigation started, well, started January of 2011, and we the trial was over like in 2014, so 2000, it was 2010 with the investigation and mm -hmm. the Coast Guard hearings, 2011, 12, 13, 14. Four years down there preparing the case and then trying it. We were several months down there in the trial of it and did that before Judge Barbier and he issued his opinion and it turned out well for my client. And it's really it, evident that you were super passionate about your work and, and super dedicated to your clients. And can you tell us a little bit about um, your family? I heard you mention your wife. Do you have children, grandchildren? Yeah. Well, I'll say before I leave that, I do want to say about the Halliburton case that it is reported to have, it is reported to have been the largest environmental case ever filed and tried to a verdict anywhere in the world ever, and that record still holds today. Wow. So that's pretty nice to have been a part of that. That's but it was all a great team effort, I'll tell you. I had maybe one of the finest teams of lawyers that ever I've ever known put together any, anywhere that was there with me putting that case together and putting it on. But anyway, as far as my family, I have a wife and I have uh, two children. I have a son that lives in Washington, state of Washington, and I have a daughter that lives here, and I have two grandchildren, Mason and Judd. They're 13 and 10, and of course my wife, and uh, we live here in Dallas, and um, 
my wife and I have a little little toy poodle for a pet. Nice. And your wife's name is? My wife's name is Carmen. Nice. And uh, I, I, at one point, did Natalie help with the business? Yeah. Natalie, Natalie after she had gone through undergraduate school and graduate school, most of it, to, and, and uh, um, um, archaeology, which I said, Natalie, what are you going to do with that? <laughs> Finally, she decided nothing. She came to work for me as a paralegal where she got her paralegal license and stayed for a number of months. And then she's very artistic. She could sit here and draw you just like a, taking a photograph of you. So we got her over into doing some marketing and coming up with some ideas and things. And she's very successful in it and put together a number of marketing plans in the 98, 99, 2000 time frame. And she was with us for several years as our director of marketing. And then she married in 2006. And when she married, then that's when she went home and, um, and quit working at the law firm. Nice. And the current name of your firm is? Godwin Bobin. And uh, when we first started today, we're here at the Arts District Mansion, formerly right. known as the Bela Mansion. We were talking about the decor and the bar that's right next door. Can you tell us what you remember about your earlier days as a Dallas lawyer and the Arts District Mansion? Yeah. Well, before I do that, I want to say, of course, Bruce is a great friend of mine. And when I first started and in, in, I was in law school, first year I was clerking for a firm that was then known as Turner, Rogers, Wynn, Scurlock, and Sailors. That's what all Rogers at, at Freeway out here, that it was uh, his uncle, one of the Rogers was uh, related to what all Rogers. Well, anyway, um, Bruce was an associate and I was a, a clerk there. And he went on after law school as I did and went to other firms. And several years ago, about maybe 17, 18 years ago, he and I got back together and, uh, and been together now for several years and after Gruber left and we went on and named the firm Godwin Bowman where it continues to be today. Uh, I was reminiscing a bit when we first sat down today about the below, what's now known as Arts District Mansion, but formerly below. Um, and I said, you know, this is such a beautiful building and uh, so proud to be a part of it. And, you know, I said, uh, this room we're in, well, it's a nice room, not a large room, but to me, when I was a young lawyer, I'd come over here and it seemed so large. And I remember we would meet Judge Jerry Buckmeyer and other prominent lawyers that would be friends of his, would meet there in the, in the bar here occasionally in the afternoon after work for a drink or whatever. And some of us young lawyers would come over and listen to him tell stories and sit and listen and learn. And that bar seemed so large at the time. You walk through there now and it seems so much smaller. And it's just reminiscent of how times have gone and how things have, you know, moved forward. And of course, the Arts District Mansion now has been added on so many times and looks so beautiful and such a great part of our profession and of the Dallas Bar and of the entire community of Dallas. But uh, things have changed a great deal. I remember when I first started practicing law, the Dallas Bar Association was on the second floor of the Adolphus Tower building over on Main Street. And I was in that building, as you know, remember that, with the Lion Klein French and Womble firm. I was over in that building, and we were two floors there in the building and the, and the Adolphus Tower, and the Dallas Bar was below us. And some of the partners, of course, I didn't have the wherewithal to do it and the money, the partners would go down to the Dallas Bar and have lunch. Right, and so I think uh, you, you've talked to us about your early days and lots of different yeah. partners and some of your good friends. I know Michael Hurst and a few others are some of your ex-partners that you still are good friends with and have business relationships with or sure. just personal? And I refer them cases and they refer me cases. I will tell you that Michael Hurst is one of, a dear friend of mine, somebody I think the world of. He joined me as when he was a law clerk in 1989, as I recall, as an associate in 90 and has gone on to do great things in the profession. I'm so proud of him. Past president of the Dallas Bar, I and, believe 2018. And on and on, it just no t the list of what he's done so far outshadows what I've accomplished. And I've told him that's what I always wanted for him, to go on and do more than I've done, as much as I've done, and hopefully more. And he exceeded it by far, I promise you. But over the years, I've had so many great 
partners with me that have gone on and either started their own firm or done other things that I've you know, cherished the friendships and all the great days we had. Uh, we had a lot of good times, did a lot of successful things together. Michael, Michael Hurst and I tried a lot, many jury cases together in the 90s all over Texas and, and had a great time doing it. It was a lot of fun. He's a really fantastic lawyer. Chrissy, I've been fortunate in my career to have worked around and with in my firm, in our firm, some of the finest lawyers that's ever come through this city. A lot of other great lawyers, no doubt, for sure. But I've had some good ones with me over the years, really great lawyers, and Marcus Ronquillo, Regina Montoya, uh, people I'm so proud of to have been associated with. See, I didn't know you and Regina were partners. Mar Mar Regina and I were partners after she left Aiken Gump. She came to work for me oh. and stayed with me for several years. And a great, great friend of mine, Pat Gayo, former trial judge and court of appeals judge. Uh, uh, Mary Lee Lewis, former trial judge. I mean, I've had some great lawyers, but I also want to say this. I've been fortunate in my career to have represented some of the some of the most well-known people, maybe in a state, certainly in Dallas, Jerry Jones, the Dallas Cowboys, Ross Bro Sr., uh, Linda Hill Weikert, uh, Exxon Mobil, Halliburton. Uh, I've represented so many of these, Harold Simmons, so many of these people. I mean, the list is like representing any one of them would be a huge deal, but to represent all of them is unbelievable. I look back on it and I think, what did I do in my career to deserve that opportunity to have represented such fine people? But I did, and I continue to represent several of them, not all of them, but several of them I still do. And that reminds me of when I met Jerry, who I've considered all these many years, going over 30 years now, a great friend. In 1991, he would bought the team in 89. In 1991, I remember, uh, and Going back that exact year, I would only remember it because that's when I met Jerry. My wife and I and another couple were at the mansion here, and we were celebrating my birthday, which was on Saturday, and that was the 14th of October, and uh, which is my birthday is the 14th. And when we were there, sitting in the bar having a drink, Jerry Jones was sitting at in the other end of the bar there with his wife and another couple, and he got up and told my wife, I said, I'm going to get up and meet Jerry Jones. She said, leave him alone. He didn't want to be bothered by you. I said, well, I'm going to anyway. And I got up, he walked by and I shook his hand and we introduced to each other. And with Jerry, you know, you meet him, you feel like he's known you forever and vice versa. And we started talking for a bit and um, that's been a long time ago. And um, we sat there that evening and had a drink together after we talked and he went back to his seat. And later on, we came together and had a drink and whatever, and, and one thing led to another. And then he asked me that night, he said, I don't see you on a case. I got something I want to give you to work on. Come out and see me next week. So Monday, I called his office and he worked me in and I got out there and he gave me my first assignment. And for another 10, 11 years or so, I did work for Jerry, all kinds of litigation and lots of it. And was fortunate enough to represent him and Stephen, Charlotte, uh, Jerry Jr., who by the way, uh, is a, another fine lawyer in his own right, uh, no longer practices, but when he was at SMU Law School, when he got out, he came to work for me. And he was down there with me for a year and a half, two years, and a very, very fine young associate and young lawyer. I enjoyed that, but I had a lot of great time, good times with him and became great friends with the Jones family and represented them in many, many things over many years and can still consider them to be very good friends. Well, that's really awesome. Two Dallas icons working well, together. Well, certainly Jerry is. Uh, you know what? I'm. <laughs> I, I've certainly enjoyed working for him all through the years, and consider him a great friend. And um, um, I remember a little funny story. He told me he said he was said Don. It's after I'd met him a month or so later. Said you ever come out to ball games? I said yeah. I've got seats out at Texas stadiums where they were then. He said well. Said um, you need to get a suite. And I said, well, I knew this was coming. You know, with Jerry's always selling. <laughs> and he said, yeah, you get a seat, a suite. He said, you'll really find it'll be one of the best marketing tools you've ever used. And it certainly has proved to be that. I've had a suite since 1991. 
in the old facility at Stadium and out the new one. And he told me one time, he said, Don, he said, here's what you will remember about that suite. You invite all your good clients out and your lawyers in your firm that are good at mixing and mingling and talking and selling. Mm -hmm. And he said, because in the law, you're really just selling just like we are in the rest of the business world. And I know that to be true. And he said, but here's what you want to do. You're going to be there to game. If you really know what the score is at any time during the game, you're not there for the right reason. I said, what do you mean by that? He said, you need to be there, Don, mingling around, getting drinks with people, getting them a hamburger, a hot dog, talking to them and making them feel comfortable. And their wives will be with them. Or their, if it's a woman you've got there, you're working with her husband will be with her. And you want to make them feel comfortable. And you're not there to watch the ball game. You're there to entertain, make money. Exactly. And I've used it for that reason for what we've had now, one since 91 to where we are 2002. We still got a suite and I've used it for so many games and ways to entertain clients and host special functions for take particularly large clients, maybe just the lawyers in the firm that work for that client and me on that one client. We have events like that. We've been out there at all the concerts and it's just such been a tremendous marketing tool all because of Jerry Jones, who I say is probably the best salesman I've ever known. That's really amazing. Yeah. Well, and I remember hearing about those stories and, and all your successes when I was in law school. Uh, for a brief moment, I think your son and I were in law school together. I know he decided, much like you, he started out as a lawyer and then I think he went a different route. Right. But he was um, very proud to be Don Godwin's son. And uh, it, it, he was one of my fondest memories of my first semester in law school. He and my roommate and I had a lot of fun. Uh, we did a, a, a lot of uh, studying together. So um, it's really been an honor to get to know you through this interview and in the last year or two. Right. And you are a living legend in Dallas County and beyond. And we really are appreciative of all the time and energy you've given to the profession uh, to the bar and to our community. Well, I appreciate uh, you those kind words, and I appreciate the opportunity to come over today and have been interviewed. Uh, I w if I stopped today, if it was over today, I could not have asked for anything more than what I've accomplished already. But if I'm going to go on past this moment and past this day, I'm going to be looking forward to achieving new new goals and things, as my mother used to say, Don. Once you reach that cloud, go for the next one. Keep reaching as high as you can. And she preached that to my sister, my brother, and myself forever. That's just what, what we heard at home. So it's been my honor to, to have been over here today, and I'm so proud to be a lawyer. And, uh, so, and really what it allows me to do is help people. I mean, I could have stopped practicing law some years ago uh, and done something else. I don't know what, but... I've done something, but I can tell you that I love helping people solve their problems. You're very active in the local community with our judiciary and supporting the local judiciary, and we definitely, uh, that doesn't go unnoticed. And uh, it's my understanding you might have a milestone birthday coming up tomorrow. Well, Is that right? I got a birthday coming up tomorrow. I view all of them as a milestone, just still being here, you know, but um, <laughs> I got one coming up tomorrow, but you know what, I'll get up in the morning and I'll put my suit on just like I do every day and come to work and I'll work through today and tomorrow night we'll go to dinner with the family and, and have a little birthday cake and celebrate and they'll sing happy birthday and, and I'll start thinking about ways that I can continue to do things to help my family and help others around me. Well, you've been practicing law now almost 50 years and that's quite a milestone coming in Coming up next itself. year, coming up next year. So... Thank you. Really enjoyed speaking with you today and uh, looking forward to the next, uh, next 50 years of law Absolutely. practice. Absolutely. Thank you, Chrissy, very much. I appreciate it.